Espera. Bismillah. <coughs> Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillah. Wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. My brothers and sisters in Islam, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. But as for today, inshaAllah, I want to take you back to the beginning. To the beginning of when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created the first human being. And the reason I want to go back to that point, when Allah first created the first human being, I want to share with you an awareness of what the plot and the plan of the enemies of the human beings, of the enemies of morals, of the enemies of good, what they planned from that time until today. And it will end and it will stay going until the, until the hereafter or until the world ends. The plan of Iblis himself and his conversation with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and his arguments which he put forth, the challenges he put forth and the double challenge which Allah gave him. Adam alayhi salam's response, why he ended up on earth and the plan showing us how the plan is continuing today before our eyes. We want to learn this because when you are aware of your enemy, when you are aware of your enemy, you are the best person to know how to avoid the enemy's plots and plans. The better you know your enemy, the more you understand their plots, you can avoid their harm. And Allah says in the Quran to the believers, actually He addresses all of mankind. إِنَّ الشَّيْطَانَ لَكُمْ عَدُوٌ فَاتَّخِذُوهُ عَدُوًا The shaytan is your enemy. So take him as an enemy. Do not take him as anything else. But before I start, what is a shaytan? You'll see in some uh, modern interpretations of the Quran, they consider the shaytan as not a physical being. They actually consider the shaytan as something uh, like the symbol of evil. And that the only shaitan that exists is the shaitan within our character, us as human beings. That if I call you to do something wrong, if, uh, if I am your friend and I influence you to do wrong things, I influence you to do bad things, then they're saying that I am that shaitan. Or that shaitan within me, that character of the shaitan within me is show, showing itself. Because the word shaitan means one who is deep in disbelief, one who is deep in enmity to God, one that is the friend of, of bad and the enemy of good, shaitan, one who is deep in, in evil. Now, part of that is true. Allah, the Prophet wasallam, he named a certain type of shaitan, the shaitan of the ins, the shaitan of the human being. So the human being does have the meaning of evil inside of them, if they want to use it. Allah says in the Quran, And the person, the self, and the way God has created the self, He gave it the tendency to do good, and He gave it the tendency to do evil. Your desires can lead you in any way. You just choose that. So there is a shaitan in us. And the Prophet ﷺ also told us about shaitan al-ins, the human devil, and that he is the worst. He called a friend as a shaitan, is the worst thing. Why? Well, there are things you can say that make the shaitan, the real devil, run away. As for the shaitan of the human being, you can say, A'udhu billahi min shaitan al-rajim, for example, from now until a thousand years later, and that person will still stay there. The word, A'udhu billahi min shaitan, I seek refuge in God from you, you will not leave. And you can recite Quran, the shaitan can go. But the human being is the worst. Worst influence. And you can see him and touch him or whatever. So therefore, what am I saying? When they said that there's no such thing as a physical shaitan, they erred, those who interpreted. Why? First of all, they used philosophy. And we, do not, we are not followers of philosophy. We are followers of what Allah brings down to the messenger. And we take it on its surface meaning, unless our Messenger وسلم, explains it in a different meaning. Or the Arabic language 
shows us, if you're an Arab, that's obviously meaning something else. For example, a companion of the Prophet ﷺ, a good companion. When fasting was prescribed on the Muslims, a verse in the Quran came down saying, فَكُلُوا وَاشْرَبُوا حَتَّى يَتَبَيَّنَ لَكُمُ الْخَيْطُ الْأَبْيَضُ مِنَ الْخَيْطُ الْأَسْوَدِ مِنَ الْفَجْرِ Eat and drink in the night until the white thread is clear to your sight from the black thread. Now this Sahabi's companion took it literally and neglected the Arabic metaphor. He said, ah, this means I'll bring a black string, a black thread, and a white thread. Because in Arabic, khayt means string, until the white string is shown from the black string. That's what the Quran says. So he brought a black string and a white string. And he placed them on his pillow in front of him at dawn. And he kept looking at them. And when he was able to distinguish the white thread from the black thread, when he can see both threads in the day, it meant that that's it. He's not going to eat or drink anymore. He's going to begin his fasting. So look at the white thread. He can see it a little bit more at night. As the day comes out, he can then see the black thread. So when the Prophet ﷺ heard about this, he said to him, Inna ka aridul qafa. A meaning that, a, a, a phrase that the Arabs used to use that, you know, you're smarter than that. You're an intelligent person. You know, you're broad-minded. That's what it means. You're broad-minded. In other words, <laughs> you know, you actually were narrow-minded in this particular circumstance. What it means is that the brightness of the day, the clear thread that you see in the horizon, if you look right out into the sea, for example, and you were to look where the sun first shows its speck of light, when it comes out, there's a clear white line as if it's right on the horizon. And the darkness is clear from the whiteness, that white thread across the horizon. That's dawn. He said it means when the sun first shows its first, absolute first glimpses of light across the edge of the earth or the, the, the horizon of the earth or the shape of the earth. You see, it's a metaphor. So here there is an Arabic metaphor that an Arab should understand that it doesn't mean literally. However, the shaitan is something that is literal. Why? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions in the Quran about a creature called the jinns. Jinns. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ سُلَالَةٍ مِنْ طِينَ Allah says He created the human beings from a type of clay. خَلَقَ الْإِنسَانَ مِنْ صَلْصَالٍ كَالْفَخَّارِ He created the human being from a type of clay that creates a salsal sound. So when you hit it, when it's dried, it goes like that. So it's like ceramics. Allah created us from a similar clay to ceramics. In the earth, believe it or not. This is what we're made from. Originally from Adam alayhi salam. My origin and your origin is from clay. Originally. And he created the other life form called the jinns. From a special part of the fire. A special part of the fire. Have you ever looked at a fire and seen sparks? sort of just come out like that, as if they're not connected to the fire. Those little sparks that emanate from the fire is what Allah created the jinns from. He created them from that. So the origin is from fire. What are these jinns? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala describes the jinn in the Qur'an, and the Prophet describes the jinn as different levels. There are jinn who are shayateen, just like there are human beings who can become shayateen, who can become shaitans. And as we said, the literal meaning of shaitan, one who deepens themselves in kufr, in disbelief, in evil. So there are jinns who become shaitan and there are humans who become shaitan. But there is a real form of jinns who are shaitans. And we normally refer to shaitan as the devil, uh, who is not a human being. But it actually means two things, the devil of the human and the devil of the jinn. And there are other names. Allah mentions, for example, members of the jinn called ifrit, which is worse than the shaitan. Remember in the story of Sulaiman alayhi salam, Allah says, قَالَ عَفْرِيتٌ مِنَ الْجِنِّ A ifrit from the jinns said to Sulaiman, I can do this. So, ifrit is another form, a higher, as what our scholars explain, is that they are deeper and deeper in disbelief than the shaitan. And they're also of jinns. Shayateen al-insi wal-jinn. Prophet ﷺ makes a dua, the shaitans of the humans and the jinns. So now we are clear that there is a life form called the jinns directly from the Qur'an. A person who rejects this has rejected the information of the Qur'an. Because there is no other 
There is no other interpretation by our Prophet ﷺ or his companions or in the Qur'an that would tell us otherwise. There is another life form. And Allah specifies in the Qur'an about Iblis and his army. He and his army, the army of the shaitans, of the jinns, can see you, whereas you cannot see them. They exist. They're here. Now that I've said this, there was a jinn. His name was Iblis. His name was Iblis. And Allah has cursed Iblis in the Quran. To curse someone and say la'nah to someone is a major sin in Islam, especially to a Muslim. Only whom Allah has cursed, you can curse. We have no right to curse. Because a la'na, the cursing in Arabic, loosely curse, but in Arabic it's called la'na, literally means to expel someone, to expel someone out of the mercy of God. And there is no way to enter paradise without the mercy of God. So to say to someone, may God curse you, may Allah yil'anak in Arabic, is a tremendous word to say to someone. And the word la'na, the Prophet ﷺ told us, whoever says la'na, curse to something, an object or someone that doesn't deserve it, the la'na returns back to its owner, if no one else deserves it. You're going to be very careful. It's the same as kufr as well. You say to someone, you're a disbeliever. That word is released. If, no one is, if the person you say it to is not entitled to it, it comes back at you. There's a Muslim who comes back. So the Iblis is cursed. He is one of those who are mal'oon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala expelled him out of his mercy. One might think, does Allah expel someone out of his mercy, out of his forgiveness? When God called himself, I am the most merciful, I am the forgiver. He says in the Quran, Nabbi ibadi, Nabbi ibadi anni ana al rahim Tell my servants that I am the most merciful. I am the oft forgiver. There are many verses in the Qur'an that Allah forgives all things, no matter how deep and how far you go. There is another hadith al-Qudsi, just to illustrate so you can appreciate this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us in the hadith, which the Prophet sallallahu says, but he said it on behalf of God. So he says, God says. Sometimes you get hadiths that God says, but they're not in the Qur'an, but they're narrated on the tongue of the Prophet sallallahu This is out of respect and honor for our messenger, to tell us that the Qur'an and the words of the Prophet are the same. The characteristics are different, that's all. So he said in the hadith Qudsi. So when I tell you Qudsi, hadith Qudsi, it means the Prophet said it with his mouth on behalf of God, but it is not Quran. So he said, hadith al Qudsi, that Allah says, O oh my servant, if you come to me on a day of judgment and you have got the, as much as the world can hold of sins, as much as the world can hold of sins. But you approach, you came to me on a day of judgment and your heart is free from any shirk. Shirk. Meaning, making partners with God in any way. So polytheism, making partners with God in any way. I will come, I will meet you with that, with a forgiveness. The same size as your sins. Now that's one thing. But obviously there are sins which Allah may not forgive. But I'm just illustrating to you how far God's forgiveness and mercy can reach. A man, you know this story, which is in Bukhari. A man, Prophet ﷺ tells us about a man, he killed 90, he murdered 99 people. Innocent lives. And after murdering them, he wanted to repent. He wanted to mend. He wanted to fix it. And he's thinking, how can I... How is there possibly any space for me to do that? So he went to a worshipper. A what? A worshipper. Now when you say worshipper, not necessarily a knowledgeable one. Someone who was in his hut worshipping for decades, but had no knowledge. This worshipper had no knowledge. Just worships night and day, prays, reads, but doesn't understand what he reads. He asked him, I have killed 99 lives, I can say. Is there room for forgiveness for me to make amends? He said to him, Whoa, you have killed 99 innocent souls. There is no room for forgiveness for you. You're doomed. Man, who does something like that? So the man is still in his rage, still in his old habits, still in his old, you know, character. 
Obviously, what did he do? Killing is easy for him. He drew his sword and killed this man as well out of anger. Who are you to judge me, he said, and killed him. He goes, oh my God, it's a hundred. You know, anger problems, this man. Severe ones. So he went. He kept searching his life until he found a scholar. This time, a scholar. One who is knowledgeable about what he reads, knowledgeable when he prays, knowledgeable of what Allah said, not just ritual. He says, Astaghfirullah, 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 doesn't know what he's saying. La ilaha illallah, but just, it's just something. And, never, and you find them doing the worst of acts. Because they don't understand what they're saying. Man. They have no idea what they're saying. Cocky. You can teach a cocky to say the F word, or you can te teach the cocky to say the L word. La ilaha illallah. It's all, you know, just a cocky. It doesn't mean anything. So he went to the scholar, and the scholar said to him, there is only one way for you. Yours is a severe circumstance, but there is a way still. You have to leave the area that you're living in. Because the community you're around, and the atmosphere you're around, has caused you to be the way you are. If you want me to interpret what it's like today, for a person like him to, in today's world, I would say, the media around you, the friends that you have, you know, the things that the people that influence you around you are corrupt. You need to leave them. So you need to make that effort of change. Because the only way you will change is by leaving this. You have to change your environment which has influenced you. So he did that effort sincerely from his heart. The only thing that man had left with him over all his actions of his life was his sincere heart. Listen carefully. I'm going to tell you about Iblis because there's a good moral here that fits with it. The twist. He still had a sincere heart, meaning he loved Allah, he wanted Allah, he felt bad about what he did, but he couldn't feel the wrong. He couldn't feel the wrong. He was too numb to it. So he went, he left. On his way, exactly half of the way, between him and that next place that he was going, migrating to, it was the qadr of Allah, it was the will of Allah, the pre-measurement of God that the man had to die halfway. And he fell, in, in, in the narration it says, he fell head first, forward. It says that angels of the heaven and angels of, angels of the mercy and angels of the torture came down. We discussed that in our series of the, the hereafter. And they were in conflict, confused. The angels of mercy say he died on forgiveness, on, on, on truth. The other one said, no, he died on sin. He didn't make it to the place that he was going to. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala facilitated it between them. And he said, if he is closer to the place that he is going to, then he has won, he has made the effort. So they measured and found that he was a body length closer. <laughs> Fell forward. That was actually Allah's plan. Why? Allah wanted to forgive him, but he wanted to make the reason to forgive him. You, he doesn't make the choice for you, but he will assist you once you make the effort yourself. You have to make the first step. The only way you can make the first step is if you are sincere, not hypocritical. And now I take you back to Iblis. Remember what I said, sincerity. I'm taking you back to the story of Iblis now. Iblis was expelled out of the mercy of God. I wonder what he did. I wonder what he did. Iblis, first of all, was a jinn. And he had a position among the ranks of the angels. He actually worked among the angels, literally. But he wasn't an angel, he was a jinn, made of fire. The angels are made of light. Allah tells us that the angels are made of light. And Prophet tells us this. He had a special rank. He was God-fearing. He was devout. He was a worshipper, wallahi. And he believed in the oneness of God and his might and power and everything. And he turned to him. He was a righteous servant of God. In every meaning of the word. However, something inside of his heart. When we say heart, we don't mean literally the organ that's pumping blood. When we say heart in Arabic, we mean the mind. Something here. In here, something inside. If you change hearts, literally, you're not going to change that. that. That stays with you, the mind. It's something in here. 
Iblis had something in here, something that wasn't right. He, it was a secret. And Allah, He doesn't put that in you. But Allah gives you the opportunity, the, the circumstances to have it if you want to, depending on how you choose. This is the will of God. His knowledge is unbelievable. Is, is, uh, we cannot explain it. So Iblis, Allah tested Iblis. It was a test and there were many other plans as well to this test. At the same time, the test of Iblis is also, was also going to be a test for Adam, السلام, our father. And the test of Adam was also going to be a test for us. And it, so Allah tested. Yeah, and you forget about it. A person who has got a mind of a genius in chess, for example. Chess. You know how much you plan. You can plan 20, 100 moves ahead. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has planned and knows not a hundred moves, infin infinite moves. In one hadith it says, before Allah created the, uh, the, the world, He created the pen. And He told the pen to write everything that will be 50,000 years before the creation of this world. And Allah had His knowledge even before that. There's nothing that, you know, we're talking about the leaf that falls, when it's going to fall, how it's going to fall, at which place it's going to fall, and how it's going to get there. The leaf. The ant, its cell, the cell in its leg, in its foot, how it's going to go, how it's going to move, when it's going to end, which cell's going to die. If you want me to go deeper and deeper, your mind's going to, it's going to reach a, a, a stage where there's no more thinking for us. You're going to start doubting, is it possible? And we don't need, it is, of course it is, because we know it is there. We know it's there, because here we are. The reality of it, Allah says, قُلْ لَوْ كَانَ الْبَحْرُ مِدَادًا لِكَلِمَاتِ رَبِّي لَنَفِدَ الْبَحْرُ قَبْلَ أَن تَنْفَدَ كَلِمَاتُ رَبِّي وَلَوْ جِئْنَا بِمِثْلِهِ مَدَدًا Say, tell them, O Muhammad, if the ocean of the world, the waters of the world, were turned into ink for the pen of my Lord, metaphorically, if they were really ink, the ink, the oceans will deplete, they'll run out. Before your Lord's knowledge runs out, even if we brought another set of oceans the same size to be the ink. In another verse, if the, if the trees of the world were cut into pencils or pens, and the ink, the oceans of the world were made as their ink, they would run out even if we brought back seven folds and more. Allah says, all the trees of the earth, وَالْبَحْرُ يَمُدُّهُ and, the, and the, the, the oceans keep on supporting, giving more. And the verse says, سَبْعَةُ أَبْحُرٍ Seven whole oceans of the earth. Allah's knowledge will never run out. No, it's just never ending. So who are you comparing now? You can't. All we know is what happened. Iblis says something about him. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to do with his infinite knowledge, deserving and with justice. Something had to happen. What was it? It had to happen. It's not like... It's in, in God's knowledge that it had to be there. It, it's just how it had to be. You can't blame God. It's, that's how it had to be. Iblis was going to be tested with his righteousness. So Allah said to his angels one day, This is a test to the angels. Although the angels don't sin. But he wanted to teach the angels something and wanted to teach us something by telling them this. What is it? He said to them, O oh my angels, I am about to create a creation, a being made of clay. And the angels know that there are angels made of light and Allah had created the jinns made of fire. Allah only knows what else he has created before us. God knows. We don't know. We haven't been informed. But now the angels are told that a creature is going to be created from clay. Now the angels had known the jinns before what they had done. They shed blood and corrupted on earth. This earth was here before us, as according to the Quran. And the jinns lived here, and they still do, and they corrupted and shed blood. So Allah sent the angels down, and they actually had a battle, and they forced them out into the islands of the world. That's where their headquarters are. This is knowledge which Allah told us about. So the angels replied, they said, O oh, our Lord, are you going to create a creature on earth that will shed blood again and corrupt again 
when we glorify your name and your and praise they're not questioning but they're asking to seek knowledge the confused our, our Lord look I mean you know here we are we're praising you we're glorifying you the jinns look what they did we don't understand the reason behind creating another creation when they're gonna shed blood and corrupt what are they actually saying they're afraid they're saying in other words oh our Lord have we done something to you are you displeased with us because we're glorifying here we are but obviously they didn't understand what's happening God did not explain it to them explain it because they will not understand until they see so all he said was this he said I know that which you just do not know you cannot know it's not that if I told you you will know no it's like you cannot know even if I told you like give you a, maybe an example that can sort of give us a simple understanding if you had a two-year-old child and you have an advanced piece of oven, an advanced uh, cooktop. To the two-year-old, it looks shiny, but it's very hot, and they don't understand what that color is—an uh, orange color on the cook on the cook. So it just looks nice, looks bright. How can you let that two-year-old child understand that if they touch that cooktop, it's going to burn them? They don't understand what heat is. They don't understand what... All they see is a bright color. You can say it to them in a thousand different ways. They will not understand it. Unless they feel something. Yeah? So, with the angels, their knowledge is premature for this type of knowledge. This type of knowledge. Allah said, Inni a'lamu ma la ta'lamun. I know what I'm doing. I know what you do not know, you cannot know this unless you experience what's going to happen. Now, so Allah created Adam alayhi salam. One day we'll go through the detailed story of his creation, but I want to get you to the point now. He created Adam alayhi salam. When Allah created Adam alayhi salam, Iblis had heard the angels what they had asked. And everybody's talking about it. And Iblis... He's, he's starting to think here. What is so special about this creature which God had created? Curiosity. And at the same time, something began to develop in his heart. A form of jealousy. Why? Here is Iblis among the rank of the angels, wanting to please his Lord. Loves his Lord, wants to please him. And now something had come up which he had never anticipated, never thought of, and suddenly he feels something strange coming out. He could have controlled it, but he let it take over, consume him. It was the jealousy. Jealousy began. So he went to look at this creature, and he saw it. It didn't look too impressive to him. It was made of clay, dark. It was dark in color because there was no soul in it. It was just clay. He tapped it, and he kicked it. And it made a ringing sound. And he was able to, th to flow through it. Because he's created from a less denser material, which is f flames of fire, he was able to flow through this body. And he found, as in the hadith, he found that we were hollow. If you take the drain the blood out and everything, we're very hollow actually. Our blood makes up more, like, probably about more than 60% of our, of our body mass. Huge. We're hollow. So he thought, you are a weak creature. That's what he thought. How he thought it? Because of the way he's created. Allahu alam. As time went, Allah left the body of Adam alayhi salam like that. And every time Iblis looked at it, he felt fear a bit. Looking at a dead body is quite frightening, isn't it? Well, imagine seeing something like that. Iblis saw it and he was frightened. But at the same time, he's trying to beat his fear. And say, I'm better than you. You're not going to be better than me. Do whatever you want. Now the angels on the other hand said among each other, said, look, inshallah, God willing, he's not displeased with us. But no matter what he creates, we know that we are God's favored. But they weren't jealous. They were just fearful. Will God, is God displeased with them? Have they lacked in their duties. That's all. Different to Iblis. Iblis is like jealousy. 
He's not going to be better than me. I'm going to be better than him. What's so special about him? Like that. I will always be God's favorite. And, he, and, I'm, going to, and I'm going to do everything about it to be that way. It's like that. The angels were, we're sure he's not going to be better than us. But if he is, we're not, we're not upset so long as he's pleased with us. Like that. Allah left him there until that jealousy developed more and more and more. More. And now it turned into prou- proudiness, arrogance. Jealousy turned into proudiness. I, I warn you, brothers and sisters, jealousy is the first disease of the heart which develops into proudiness. It's like cancer. It starts from a simple thing. It starts from, let's say, uh, standing underneath the UV of the sun. Stand underneath it long enough, you may get cancer. The cancer of the heart is proudiness, is kibriya. So now he had proudiness. And he didn't do anything about it. Allah created Adam, put his soul into him. Story goes on. And he brought Adam alayhi salam before the angels. وَإِذْ قَالَ رَبُّكَ لِلْمَلَائِكَةِ اسْجُدُوا لِآدَمْ فَسَجَدُوا إِلَّا إِبْلِيسِ أَبَا وَاسْتَكْبَرَ وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ Sorry for the croaking of my voice. He said, And when your Lord brought Adam alayhi salam before the angels, He said to them, Prostrate to Adam. Sujudu lahum. Bow down to him on the ground. To Adam alayhi salam. Fasajadu. The angels all obeyed. There's a letter there. The letter before the word sajadu, which means they prostrated. There's a letter. It says fa. Fasajadu. Fasajadu means they immediately prostrated. No hesitation. Then Allah says, إِلَّا Iblis, Except for Iblis, he didn't prostrate. Then Allah further explains why. Abba, he chose to, re- to refuse. He actually objected. He refused. So it was a conscious refusal. So you don't think that he couldn't. He could. But he consciously refused. Telling us that it's the same for us as humans. You also have a choice. And if you don't, it's because you consciously chose not to, knowingly. Iblis Abba, coming back to him. Wastakbar, not only did he refuse, Allah is telling us why he refused. The reason he refused is because he allowed himself to be proud. Proud as in not happy, arrogant. وَكَانَ مِنَ الْكَافِرِينَ And that resulted in him becoming among the disbelievers. He hid the truth. Kafir, the, literally the word kafir means to hide the truth deep and to cover it up. That's what kafir means. Knowing the truth, hiding it, denying it. So kufr can also mean denial. Not just disbelief. Denial of the truth, knowing it. That's why some people don't know the truth. Can we all call them kuffar? Only Allah knows. But the word kafir, one who knows the truth, denies it. And then build some falsehood on top of it. Argues, debates on falsehood. So Iblis was one of those. Another one, Allah SWT, another reason, Allah SWT says, Iblis explains. Allah says, قَالَ مَا مَنَعَكَ أَلَّا تَسْجُدَ لِمَا خَلَقْتُ بِيَدَيْ What prevented you, O Iblis, to prostrate to one who I have created with my own hands? Allah created him directly. What did Iblis respond? قَالَ أَنَا خَيْرٌ مِّنْهُ I am better than him. him. I am better than him. him. Why? Why? You made me out of fire. fire. You made him out of of clay. Clay. I'm from fire. Fire. He's from from clay. clay. He's from rubbish. I'm fire. He's clay. They cannot cannot be equal. I'm better than him. I'm higher. I'm, I'm, I'm right up here, man. He's down here. Uh, is that okay? Do humans go through that? Yes, they do. This is proud. A'udhu billah. Rasul sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, لَن يَدْخُلَ الْجَنَّةَ أَحَدٌ Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, فِي قَلْبِهِ مِثْقَالُ حَبَّةٍ مِنْ كُبْرٍ No one will enter paradise if in their heart there's an atom's worth or a mustard seed's worth of proudiness. They said, Ya Rasulullah, what is proudiness so we can avoid it? He said, it's two things. 
to reject, the, to deny, reject the truth when it comes to you arrogantly, and to look down upon others, to see yourself that you are better than others. So you you, you show you, you, you put yourself above them, and that you are privileged more than them, like that. That's why the Prophet ﷺ hated anyone standing up for him out of honor. He didn't, he didn't like people standing to him. It's not haram to stand to someone like your father, your grandfather, or some respect, but the person should not like people to stand up for him out of honor and respect. That's why we are buried with, buried with only a cloth. That's why Allah says, فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ هُوَ أَعْلَمُ بِمَنِ اتَّقَى And never praise yourselves in righteousness. Don't say, I am righteous. It is God who knows really who is righteous. فَلَا تُزَكُّوا أَنفُسَكُمْ there are some people, Allah says, وَإِذَا قِيلَ لَهُ اتَّقِ اللَّهِ أَخَذَتْهُ الْعِزَّةُ بِالْإِثْمِ And when it is said to him, the person with proudiness, Fear your Lord, be conscious of your Lord, he rejects. أَخَذَتْهُ الْعِزَّةُ بِالْإِثْمِ He begins proud and he says, Well, what's wrong with me? Why should I? You fear your Lord. Me? You're telling me? You should go and fear your Lord. Don't tell me. That's a part of proudiness. When a person says, fear Allah, you put your head down. Like the one who said to Umar ibn Khattab radiallahu anhu, when he stood up as the Amir of the believers, and he said to them, if I tell you to do something wrong, I err in my leadership, what will you do? What can you do? Huh? Imagine now, presidents, I'll mention Arab presidents of today, standing up, say, what are you going to do? Oh, if anyone says anything, they're finished. Umar ibn Khattab stands and says, what are you going to do if I choose to err? Abdullah, and then guess what? Abu Ubaid ibn al-Jarrah, from down there, he looked at him and he signaled. Didn't even need to say it. He just said this. We will show you the edge of the sword if you err and lead these people astray. So what if you're our leader? You have a responsibility. Umar al-Khattab put his head down and cried. And he said, the reason I asked this question is because the Prophet ﷺ said, corruption in the meaning, corruption of my ummah is upon corrupted leaders. Alhamdulillah, I find people among my flock that are still righteous. It means that I'm not corrupt, inshallah. You see? No proudiness. And he said, if I err and I take someone's right, I will place my cheek on the floor and you will step on my other cheek until I give you back your right. I promise you. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, he wrote a letter to the king of Rome, the emperor of Rome, Byzantine, the Byzant Byzantine Empire. He said to him, Heraclius, Why do you not fear God? Why do you not believe in Him? Why are you arrogant? Are you feeling proudness over God? How can you feel proudness in front of God? And you came out of the same exit where urine exits from. Twice. You came out from there twice. Where urine exits from, from the male and the female, you came out there twice, we as humans. First from the father, then from the mother. So, birth. Allahu Akbar. Remember, Allah says, فَلْيَنظُرُ الْإِنسَانُ مِمَّا خُلِقْ Let man remember. What are they created from? Don't ever have proudness over others. Remember what you created from. If you want to be up and high, as in high as in you don't go for drugs to be up and high. You go for your righteousness, spirituality. That's what makes you important. Up in the ranks of the angels. So he said, I am better than him. You made me from fire. And he is from clay. I'm white. You're dark. I'm dark. You're white. I'm from this family. You're from that family. You know, we don't marry from people like that. We don't associate with you. In Islam, there's no such thing. This is the greatest, the first major sin ever. Shirk. It's actually shirk. It's proudness. It's shirk with Allah. So he said, I am better than him. You made me from fire. You made him from clay. I refuse to prostrate to him. No. Allah then said to him, Okay, very well. Are you adamant about your decision? He said, I am adamant. Allah gave him chances. He continued. Then Allah finally said to him, I created him and I am the one who commanded you. You have disobeyed me outright and arrogantly. He said, 
وَعِزَّتِكَ وَجَلَالِكَ This is now Iblis's reply. When Allah told him, I'm the one who is commanding you. This is Iblis's reply. وَعِزَّتِكَ وَجَلَالِكَ He swore an oath by God's honor and his might. <laughs> Allah, what bigger arrogance than that? He acknowledges Allah, knows Allah, and he knows his honor and his might, and he says, I swear by your honor and might. It means he believes in God. He knows God better than most people of today and of the past. In fact, maybe more than anyone who's existed except for the prophets. He knows Allah very well. By your might and by your power, I will lead them all astray. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. He swears by Allah's honor and might, acknowledging his might and honor. And then he tells him, what you've done, I'm going to wreck it. It's like saying, I believe you. You are more powerful than me and you are mighty and you can do anything you want. I know that. But you know what you've done? I'm going to wreck it. In this utmost arrogance, proudiness of any sort. At least therefore Allah says, okay, very well. You want to, Allah says to him, you want to lead them astray. That's the challenge. He said, I'm going to lead all his children astray. I'm going to go to every one of them. I'm going to lead them astray. Allah said, okay, very well. Since you've done that, I'll give you some ideas as well because you can go for that challenge. I'll challenge you too. He said, وَأَجْلِبْ عَلَيْهِمْ بِخَيْلِكَ وَرَجِلِكَ وَشَارِكْهُمْ بِالْأَمْوَالِ وَالْأَوْلَادِ وَعِدْهُمْ وَمَا يَعِدْهُمُ الشَّيْطَانُ إِلَّا غُرُورًا Go ahead. Lead. فَاسْتَفْزِزْ مَنْ اسْتَطَعْتَ مِنْهُمْ بِصَوْتِكَ Before that. Climb on top of any one of them that you are able to. Stafziz is an Arabic word used for climbing on a horse and steering it. You climb on a horse and you steer it if you're a good horseman. He says, Istafziz, be a good horseman. And climb on, pot on top of the servants who want to be horses for you. And try to delude them away with your voice. Sautik. What's shaitan's voice? I'll leave it up to you to analyze what is shaitan's voice, do you think? Since you can't hear him, what is his voice there for? I'll leave that. And then he said, and try to delude them away by showing them materialism, materialistic things. Let them be involved in materialistic things with their horses and their well groomed in other words, their cars and their homes and their clothes and their money and their this and their, and their desires. And sharikhum, associate with them, like be a part, be a partner with their children. Use their children against them. And with their money, use their money against them. Wa'idhum and gives them and give them false hopes or false promises. And also, in another verse, make them afraid. Make them afraid of poverty. That in the future they're going to get poor. So then they'll resort to haram. They'll resort to theft or to uh, indecent types of jo haram jobs to earn their money or to indecent earnings, improper earnings. Make them afraid that you're going to get poor. You're going to lose out. You're going to be out on the street. So go and get haram. Do that. Allah is telling the shaitan to do that. Allah says, but the shaitan never promises anyone except deception. He does not mean anything he says. He knows you better than yourself. And he works step by step. Now guess what Allah then said to him. This is what Iblis replied. He said, then O oh my Lord, anzirni ila yawmi yubathum. Okay, the challenge between you and me is there now. But I want something from you. If that's the case, Keep me alive until the day they are resurrected. Give me time. Allah says, We will give you time, but not what you're asking. Not until the day of resurrection. You want to escape death? No. We will give you time until the end of the world. When the hour goes, you will die with them. That's your time. Then, Allah said to him, But wait. إِنَّ عِبَادِي لَيْسَ لَكَ عَلَيْهُمْ سُلْطَانِ I'm going to tell you something. My true servants, you will not have power over them. That's the only thing. Then the Iblis replied, he said, Okay, I will lead them all astray. إِلَّا عِبَادَكَ مِنْهُمُ الْمُخْلَصِينَ Except your servants among them who are sincere. Those are the only types of people, my brothers and sisters, whom Iblis and the Shayateen have absolutely no power over. The ones whose hearts are absolutely sincere. There's no hypocrisy in it. 
repent to Allah when they do wrong. They feel regret when they've done wrong. They blame themselves when they've gone astray. And they complain to Allah. هذا وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين جزاكم الله خير. May Allah reward you. والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته والحمد لله.